Hi, so I'm Ben Weil, and um, at first, I, I, like everyone else, I want, I want to thank uh, uh, Fraunhofer and particularly Kurt for organizing this. With, um, it's been really helpful. Um, and just a, a little bit about where I'm coming from. So I'm, I take a very northeastern biased perspective. Um, I, I've worked as an air sealer, insulator, energy auditor in the Mass Save program, and it, so I've, you know, I've kind of been in the trenches of retrofitting. Um, and then I've also done kind of other uh, kind of more consulting sort of work. But I'm also very, a very northeast focused. I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to have some data slides and they're going you know, to whip by way too fast for you to actually get, glean the data and we can go back and, and talk about them. Um, but it's mainly to illustrate the value, I think, of thinking small. Um, so, uh, it, you know, I, I want to encourage people to think about the boring and uh, stupid stuff. So obviously, just one word, aerogels. Um, so this is more or less the conversation that I had with my grandfather in 1988. Um, and I mean, and, and he, he was an MIT uh, engineer, so you know, so he must have been right. And it really is the perfect enclosure home. It's R, you know, high R value. Um, it, you can get your daylight and your solar gain, your thermal resistance, it's tunable. I mean, my goodness, it's great, except I'm still waiting for one that anyone can actually afford or install. Um, I mean, people, here it is installed, but I mean, to act, actually afford. It, so to me, I'm really impatient. It, it feels kind of like cold fusion. Um, <laughs> uh, it, because I'm really impatient. Um, and that's because in the Northeast, again, this is my bias, 40% of the households still have single pane windows. 60% um, of them ha have uh, double pane windows, but only 8% have low E glazing, which you know, we can discuss whether that's actually been a boon or a benefit depending on where they put the windows. Um, but there's, there's a big opportunity there, right? Now, of course, we have much, much better windows available. There, there are ones with heat mirror, uh, you know, several heat mirror films and uh, excellent gas fills. Um, you've got kind of a passive house approach, which uh, doesn't do with the films and does more with just extra panes of glass and good gas fills and really well thermally broken panes, uh, thermally broken uh, frames, rather. Um, and then there's the solution, which is the only piece of good news that I have for my students who mostly are renters and can't control the, the envelope of their buildings at all, except for putting up hairdryer plastic. Now, the window there is just to show you, you know, you're doing it. Looks well, ugly. This one has been here on my house uh, for three years with no touch up. And just this summer, uh, like a few days ago, my wife decided she was going to wash the windows. And she goes, Is there plastic on these? <laughs> three years, she didn't know. <laughs> um, so, so it can be installed well. Um, you know, part of the secret is that I stuck a little desiccant gel. You know when you buy sneakers and, and, they, and they always come with those little packets they do not eat? Don't eat, but save, because you can stick inside the, the space between the glass and, and the plastic. And then whatever humidity was there the day you installed it will get absorbed. Pretty cheap. Um, and, here's, and this is the problem. So here's your single pane with window film. Payback is less than a year which means it's great news for my students who are you know, living on, on a budget in buildings they don't control. Um, and so you've got all these other choices, and I'm not, not going to go over all of them, but you've got these great windows, but the payback is like 27 years. That's really frustrating, because I want them so badly. <laughs> um, but I can get really close to that with an existing two-pane window plus an, a, a double paned interior storm. Now I, I've been working on these um, you know just just on, on my own and, and with my students who are in the, who work with wood a lot and they're actually capable of making really beautiful things. Um, but you know you can get pretty close. Um, and so on the total uh, U value of the whole building you've made a dramatic improvement at fairly low cost. So what I think we need for windows is probably, I mean, I'd love aerogels, and I'd love really, really affordable windows, but if we can't get really affordable windows, can we have aesthetically beautiful, thermally broken, airtight windows, preferably that the cat can't scratch through? Um, 
but of course, good windows are only as good as the workmanship. And this, I love this picture because I, I ride by this house as it's going up every day. And every day I see them do something wrong. And it used to be I'd stop my bike and pull in and pull out my iPhone and start taking pictures. And I'd say, I, you know, I don't, if you'd like to think about it, you might want to flash it so that the water goes outside the window instead of behind the window. Um, and you know, all of them are flashlight or non flash whatever you want to call this, installed this way. And you know, every day, now they see me coming on my bike and they run around to the other side of the building to hide. Um, but you know, these are not unusual. Um, so I wanted to say, okay, why, why is some installation of various measures done really well and why is some just not? And so the perfect one for me is one, I knew companies that did air sealing. I really, really know air sealing because I did it for a while. And it comes with numbers. It comes with a blower door test before and after. And you know who did it. So um, the big question is, why are some crews more successful than others? Um, so I asked him a bunch of questions. And I I'm not going to get into kind of how I did the study. We can talk about that later. It's ongoing, and it's really, really small n right now. But the results from this tiny little study are significant enough I still wanted to talk about them. Um, so we, we were interested in, did they go through a training program? I asked a really, really simple question about how uh, airflow works in terms of, of heat loss to understand whether they understood building science well or poorly. It was binary. Um, why they did it? Was it for money? Or was it because, yeah, I need the money, but I wanted to do something that mattered, something for the environment, that sort of answer to why they have jobs. And these were people I, I knew pretty well. And then in the education level, and then compare that to blower door results that were normalized. Um, well, first of all, you'll see that a lot of these things are intercorrelated. So that's kind of interesting on its own. One thing that's really interesting is that education is not correlated at all to blower door results. And training is negatively, strongly and significantly, granted the small n, uh, significantly correlated. In other words, you'd be better off if you didn't do any training. So I tried to control for the training, take out the people who were doing the training, and, and I had to kind of pick one predictor because of multicollinearity. You know, we don't have to talk about that, but the point is I chose building science knowledge as the, as the correlated variable and explained about 24% of the difference. And if you look at all these others, you know, that's, that's a big part of the, the, the difference. So when we talk about training programs, we need to think about rethinking training programs because um, these jobs are really important. I mean, uh, you know, we have state funding for them, we have utility funding, but this is a big part. And we're leaving savings on the table because some people are doing a better job than others. Um, and, you know, so one of the things it seems to me is that better building science knowledge pay them better so that they understand that they're valuable. And we need to educate customers so that they don't see them as the guys who come in because you have to so that the insulation can get in. Um, and, and really, this goes to kind of think all green jobs is raising the status of what they're doing so that they feel a sense of why they're doing it. Because when you have a high turnover rate, let's face it, I left doing a job like that for a different job because it was dirty and hard and not very well paying. So all my skills disappeared. So um, here's an example of, a, of, a, of an air sealing problem. It's recessed lights. This is with a blower door on, so you can see the heat from the attic just getting sucked into the building, right? There are an average of 20 recessed lights per new home. And, um, it, and, and there are, uh, most of those are still containing incandescent light bulbs, um, so they're kind of even worse. Um, and they've also been the most common renovation element. So we have a lot of people putting in retrofit lighting cans. And almost all of the ones before uh, the early 1990s are not rated for insulation contact. And they're leaking like crazy. So the first thing is, if they're not rated for insulation contact, insulation can't touch them. And it can't go on top either. Um, so typically what you do is you make these chimneys. You air seal the attic. And then you build a chimney around the light bulb because you don't want, you know, you won't want to break fire code. Um, and you can buy these versions, but in order, because they're built for incandescent light bulbs that heat up, you need air leakage holes at the top. So why did we buy this? Well, it's just a, a dam to keep the insulation away. And then there's these ones that are 
they do a lot of fire rating stuff. Here's somebody spray foamed around them, you know, with expensive spray foam. But the felted rock wool just you blow right through it. It's not an air barrier material. Um, so what most, especially in Massachusetts, we've gotten really good at building these boxes. Ignore all the other problems with this, uh, these two pictures. Don't, you know, <laughs> nobody would do this. Just these are pictures of boxes. Problem is, I only have pictures of people doing stuff wrong. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but these boxes are basically the function. Gypsum doesn't burn, it holds the, the insulation away. You put a lid on it, you don't put any insulation over the lid, but you can seal it tight. So you've solved the air barrier problem. The problem is that it's two and a half square feet. And it, let's say you have 20 of them. So now, you pay to put in R60 insulation, let's say, in this thousand square foot attic. And you're getting R17 actual R value. If you're the utility, say, that's, that's paying part of that, you're not getting value for money. And you just paid all those air sealers to build those boxes, which take 15 minutes per box. So, well, everybody's like, duh, we have air, uh, air insulation contact airtight fixtures. Just install those. And look, really, really low air leakage, right? Two, two cubic feet per minute at 75 pascals, that's, that's nothing. Um, so I, I wanted to see, was that really uh, the air leakage on these things? So I have these little test huts that, I, that they're kind of meter squared things. I seal them up and I do with a duck blaster. And I installed, and I, I not only installed them myself, I got grad students to install them. I even got a friend who's an electrician who installs you know, 20 of these a day to do some. Just, just just to make sure that the installation was done, and then I just kind of averaged those things. But I also thought the utility program, they're paying to install compact fluorescent light bulbs, which quite frankly, in these reflector bulbs, they suck. I mean, they take a long time to turn on, the light quality's not great, people, can, they stick out too far, and then they, they've got the glare issue, people hate them. But there are these LED downlight modules, which I guess in some ways we get to thank Fraunhofer for. Um, I, I don't know the exact history, but, but somehow you guys are involved in that.